Burrell Howard no, no. from USC Columbia. Um, and his title uh, is Integral Geometry with Application to Geometric Inequalities. Okay. I'm going to deviate slightly from my abstract because I was way too ambitious and wasn't going to get it all in. So, all right. Uh, <clears throat> Since most people don't know what integral geometry is, let me tell you, uh, give you a <clears throat> semi-typical um, <clears throat> theorem and application. So first, let's let G equal the group of motions, rigid motions, of the plane R2. Okay. And so... I'll do R2 as the set of, well, I'll write them as row vectors, but I treat them algebraically, it'll be uh, <laughs> I can't even get mad at somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I usually don't care it, so that. Okay. Uh, that. So, um, I have these group of motions. Now what the group of motions are, the orient uh, preserving ones, is it's going to be rotation by translation. So I can describe it this way. If, if P is a vector, uh, P1, P2, then uh, G of this P is going to be a rotation by, let's say, theta, and then a translation. All right? So describe of, all right, so I take this, rotate it around the origin, and translate it by x. So g is described by these three numbers. Uh, g in some sense is the set of numbers uh, theta x y with 0 less than or equal to theta less than or equal to 2 pi. And uh, what else do I have? Uh, x y is any of those r. So it's a three-dimensional set, basically is a topological space. It's just a circle uh, across the plane. And I have a measure on it, dg, which is just uh, d theta dx dy, which is the psychologically natural one. It turns out it's also the mathematically natural one. If you know what harm measure is, this is the harm measure of this group. So. <laughs> Now, uh, if C1 and C2 are curves in the plane, uh, then uh, I'll assume they're rectifiable, not bad, smooth as you want, I'm not about that. Uh, here's a question I think maybe first, uh, well, poker raise names the one associated with it. If I look at the number of points of C1 and intersect that with C2 moved by D, DG, I'd like to evaluate this thing. All right? So, I want to understand if I take one of these curves and move it around, count the point of intersection. So, in some sense, this is the average number of intersections of these two curves. What's the length get? Let's do a, a easier problem first. Let's just look at the following problem. Suppose I'm going to look at the following, the integral over R2 of just the number of points of intersection of C1 intersect uh, C2 plus xy uh, dx dy. So I'm going to take one curve, translate it, and see what happens when I get that, the number of points of intersection. Well, there's kind of an easy way to think about this, or is to try to get a feel for looking at a particular example. The easiest possible example would be, let's let C1 be that curve. Uh, let's let, say, C2 be, take two segments. And to make life slightly easier in myself, I'm going to put uh, this point here at the origin. If you think about it a minute, if I translate this curve, that's not going to change the uh, uh, value of this integral. So I can move this one curve to any translate it any place I want. Well, when is this going to intersect this then? If I translate this by something, if I translate it by x, y, uh, can I draw a parallel line? So 
here's C2. If I take this endpoint and move it up here, I'm going to get one point of intersection. Any other point, I'm going to have no intersections. So if I look at this integrand here, it's going to have the value 1 when I am uh, inside this parallelogram. And it's going to be 0 otherwise. So this thing is just the area of this thing here. Uh, which is the length of the first one, the length of the second one, times the sine, since I've already used theta, let me use phi for the angle between them. And let me write this in a slightly different way. This is all I've done here. This is a standard formula for the area of a parallelogram. And L1 is the length of my first one, L2 is the length of the second. Does that making sense? So I'm now going to write this. Think of these curves as being parameterized, C1 of S, and I'll make it unit speed parameterization uh, so that C1 prime of S <coughs> is equal to 1. I can then rewrite this here, which for the segments looks silly, but in another moment or two, hopefully won't, of the sine of the angle between the points S and T, dS. Dt. So this is actually constant in this case, but if I had curves that were variable, uh, what I do is I take my point, say here's C1 of S, here's C2 of T, I take the angle between those points and then take this. Now if I look at this integrand here, let's call this one I1 depending on C1 and C2, and this one here, I2, depending on C1 and C2. Uh, what can I say about these? If I take C1 and split it, C11 union C12, suppose I split it into two pieces with no or just one point of intersection. And I look at I1, C11, union C12, C2. I'm looking at this integrand here now, and I've replaced this by C11 union C12. What happens when I count the points of intersection? It's going to be the number of points of intersection with this one, plus the number of points of intersection with this one. And I can just split the integral, right? This thing here just becomes I1 C11 C2 plus I2, I1, I'm sorry, C12. C2. I can split that. I can do the same thing with respect to the second argument. Likewise here, if I split the curve in this one here into two pieces, I would go up to the length of the first one and the length of the second one. So it splits also. So I can do exactly the same sort of thing for this one. Uh, well, all right. What have we shown at this point? I've shown that this formula here now holds for segments. I've also shown it's additive. I think, I think that means pretty clearly it holds for polygonal paths. Okay, now if you pack calculus, what do I do? So take the limits, right. And actually, uh, while I say that very blasely, keeping track of this points of intersection and taking that limits is a real pain. There's a direct computational method that's easier. Uh, on the other hand, this formula really shows why it's true. Now, uh, I can hopefully deal with my original problem over here. Uh, I miss having boards like this back at <coughs> get to move them around. Uh, okay, let's look at uh, my, well, oh, I've raised my problem. What I'm going to do is, what was it? I was going to look at the integral over G, the number of C1 intersects GC2 dG. Um, oh, what time am I supposed to stop? 255, okay. All right. um, so this is going to be, well, integral over R2, the number of points of C1 intersect, okay. I'm going to rotate by theta uh, C2 plus xy uh, dx d 
be y uh, d theta. Uh, I will put theta out here. Uh, theta. All right. Well, now this one here, if I have my theta on the outside, this is basically the same problem as solved over here for the translations, correct? So I can say this inner integral is now uh, integral 0 to 2 pi, integral 0 to L1, integral 0 to L2, uh, absolute sine, uh, theta, the angle between the tangent vectors, but I've, I've rotated it, so that's going to put a plus theta in there. And then that is ds dt d theta. So I've reduced it to that. Now, well, what do you always do when you have multiple integrals? Well, especially if you give a hint, since I left myself space, right? So I'm going to invert the order of integration. This thing here is now just 0 to 2 pi uh, d theta. Well, now I'm just integrating, okay, this is, with respect to theta, this is a constant. So basically, uh, taking that absolute value, I'm just looking at the area of two arches of a sine curve, right? Okay, well, we've all done the problem. The area under one arch of a sine curve is 2. So this is going to be uh, integral from 0 to L1, 0 to L2, uh, 4 ds dt. So um, we can now summarize our whole thing. I'm now integrating the constant. So my integral from g cardinality C1 intersect G C2 DG is just 4 L1 L2. And this is usually called Poincaré's formula. Now, uh, <coughs> you can do, uh, let me write some formulas up here I want to keep. You can do, and in fact I think Poincaré originally did it, I did this on the plane because it's easier to draw the pictures and it's easier to write down what dg is. I can do exactly the same sort of thing here on a sphere. Take the curve here, curve here, move them around by the rigid motions, but in this case that's just the orthogonal group. All right? And a special case of this would be I'm going to take a curve here on the sphere. And I'm going to look at its average number of intersections with the um, a break circle. So an argument just exactly analogous to this, you could start with using little pieces of uh, uh, break circles where you can compute things explicitly, though it takes more work. You have that if I look at the double integral over S2 of the number of points of intersection, this is now a curve of a sphere, intersect U perp. Uh, du with respect to area measure of the sphere, uh, this turns out to be, well, one fourth of this just turns out to be the length of the curve. All right? Um, let's see. Uh, let me make sure I've got all my copies. Yes, this is correct. Now, I want to bring this up to something slightly more recent. Uh, this is a good, well, well over 100 years. So I'm going to go up to something that's about 50 years old before I get up to modern stuff. And this is something Milner did as a freshman in college, just to make us all feel bad. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to do now is look at a curve from 0L into, okay, let, let me do it this way. Let me take uh, a closed curve from S1L. So by that I mean a circle of length L, and I'm going to map that into R3 in such a way that the length of the uh, velocity vector is identically 1, so it's unit speed. Now the reason I have an L here, L exactly represents that. So 
what I've got is I've got some standard parameter circle here of uh, length of L, and I'm going to map this somehow into three-dimensional space uh, to get a curve. Now, <coughs> C prime of S, since I have a length one, this thing here is an element of S2 for all S. So this is a curve in the plane. All right. So using my uh, using my formula we just have here, I have that the uh, one fourth the double integral of the number of points of intersection with C prime, okay, or the image of the curve on the plane, intersect the great circle perpendicular to U over S2, just turns out to be the length of C prime. Well, we know from calculus that I get that. How do I compute the length of a curve? I take its velocity vector, in which case, in this case, that's going to be the second derivative. C double prime of S ds. Well, we also remember from calculus that the length of the acceleration vector of a unit speed curve is just exactly its curvature by definition. So this is the integral over the curve of curvature dr length. So uh, let me put this formula up here to say. I have that the integral over my curve of kappa ds is uh, well, actually, let me, let me do one more thing before I do that. Now, okay, so far, this was not beyond all of us. Here's where Milner proved that Milner was cleverer than the rest of us. He interpreted this in a particularly nice way. So for u an element of S2, I'm going to let h u of S equal my curve dotted against the vector u. This is a vector u. So if here's my curve and here's my direction, and uh, here's the direction of u, I'm basically just looking at the height function of this thing. It's how, if I project onto the line parallel here, this just gives me the height. If I look at h prime of u of s then, that's c prime of s dot u, and this is equal to zero, if and only if c prime of s is perpendicular to u, right? I can reinterpret this formula here now in that, uh, let me put it up at the top. <clears throat> that the uh, integral over the c of the curvature d arc length is just one fourth the double integral over the sphere of the number of points s such that uh, h u prime of s equals zero uh, d u. So I look at all the different height functions and I count the points where the derivative is zero. And this formula tells us lots of stuff very quickly. <coughs> all right. Hopefully it's not my this time. Uh, so, um, okay, this thing here, my parameter space for this thing is the circle. All right, pop quiz. How many uh, critical points does it have to have at the very minimum? Okay, I certainly have to have a maximum. Don't I have to have a minimum also? There's going to always be at least a maximum and a minimum of this thing. So from here, I can say that this thing here, there's always going to be, a, if I'm looking at a, in a particular direction, there's going to be the highest point and the lowest point. Those are going to give me derivatives of that. So this thing here is bigger than or equal to uh, S2 times 2 du. So that's 1 quarter times 2 times the area of the sphere, which is 4 pi, which is 2 pi. So the curvature, the total amount of curvature integrated gives arc length is at least 2 pi. This goes back a long ways to potential. Okay, what Milner used this to uh, prove though, uh, and this is probably
probably the birth of geometric knot theory. Okay, all right. Here's the hard part of this. I have to draw a knot. Uh, do I have it yet? There, that's a knot, right? Not a good knot. But, okay, a knot is something that I can't move from R3 into the standard position. I can't untangle it into a circle without cutting it. All right, now, if for some direction, if HU has only two critical points, okay, generally the critical points are going to come in pairs. You're going to have max divided by mins, so that except for some very specific possessions, it's going to be an even number. So if I have less than four, there's going to be some place where I have two. So here's my knot. And I have some direction, let's make it this way, where there's only two, there's one max and one min. So here's my min, here's my max. Now what I can do is, as I move up in this direction, for each height, I just connect the corresponding points at the same height with a second. And since there's no other max and mins, there's going to be exactly two of them. Now what this means is I've taken this curve and I've filled it in with a disk. All right, and one of the definitions of being the, what the knot theorists call the knot knot. All right, so it only makes sense to write a knot, uh, which is for not being knotted, is that you can span it with a disk. So that says if something's a knot, this number of critical points is always at least four. So exactly the same argument shows here. This gives us, it was done. Independently by Frey, that the integral of kappa ds over a curve is always, well, this argument as I have it here just shows it's bigger than or equal to 4 pi. It turns out that it's always bigger than 4 pi if you play with it a bit. Uh, and you can do a slight bit more here. I can define an invariant here as the bridge number. This knot in this presentation has two bridges. I had to go, when I drew it on the plane, I had one here and one here, right? Okay, that corresponds to the maximum from here. What Milner actually showed was, see, if I have a knot, this is bigger than 2 pi times the bridge number. Um, okay, uh, let's see if I can spell bridge. Okay. The bridge number, and this is sharp. Given any knot, there, uh, you can find an embedding of it where the total curvature is as close to this as you like. All right. Uh, let's go up to some modern stuff, or more modern, relating the integral geometry in one sense of another to that. <coughs> um, another very interesting integral associated with the knot is the following. I have this close. I have this knot. And I can define what's sometimes called the knot energy. It looks like this. It's the double the integral uh, over the curve cross itself, C cross C, uh, of, let's see, 1 over C of S minus C of T squared. And I'll just do this from 0 to L, 0 to L. If I looked at this thing by itself, it would diverge. So I want to subtract something off that makes it diverge. 1 over d uh, c of s, c of t squared, then ds dt. All right? This is the, oh, I just brought double brackets there to be consistent. This is just the usual straight line distance between two points. What this d of s and t is, it's the uh, distance in the curve. So I can either go around it this way or this way. I take the smaller of those two distances. All right? So this is the extrinsic R3 distance, and this is the shortest distance ant calling or crawling on the wire of the tip. All right? It turns out if this curve does not cross itself and is, say, C2, this thing is finite. 
It's known that it has a min minimum in each knot class. Uh, and it has the absolutely remarkable theorem. This was proven by uh, Friedman, uh, E, and Wong. That this is actually conformally invariant. If I do a Mobius invariant transformation, this thing stays the same. Which you know, there's you know, there, there's a reason for Friedman more feels but He did this afterwards, but this, this is not an obvious fact. Well, their paper on this stuff, they conjectured that this thing has the smallest value, the smallest it can ever be, is just for a round circle in the plane. Okay, so in fact, this is a theorem. And this is due to uh, Aaron Abrams, uh, Jason Cantarella, uh, Rella, Joe Fu, uh, Mohammed Vilmi, and myself. Uh, we really had to gang up on it. Um, but this thing here, this is E of C minimized by round circle. And we show that a lot of other things are minimized by round circles too. Um, and there's all sorts of other things you can play here that are not quite as nice. I can use different powers here and I can put an exponent up there and that. Uh, a very interesting question and probably a very hard one is, just take the uh, trifoil knot. That's the class of this thing. What's the shape of the trifoil knot? Here's a nice theorem for that. That minimizes this energy. All right. Here's another question posed by Friedman. Suppose I have a rope that's got one inch diameter and it's one foot long. Is that long enough to tie a knot? And it seems to be pretty close. Another way to say that is look at this class here. Suppose I have the, dia the diameter of the rope I'm using is that. Plus the minimum length I can still get to be, have a knot. So, and I think that's probably a pretty good place to start. That's right. Okay. It's not just, okay. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 